So while I'm getting set up, I'm seeing some familiar names, but I don't know everybody, obviously, who's here. So if you don't mind, I would love it if you could introduce yourselves in the chat by saying um, where you where you live and um, what's you know something that's really stood out for you in this series that West Cook Wild Ones has been doing on nocturnal habitat and um, what's something you've learned. That'll give me a sense of things that I can skip or emphasize um, so that I'm not being um, repetitive with things that Ed or Joy or some of the other speakers have said. Um, my plan is to focus on insects that communicate reproductively with light or with sound. Um, but uh, there's a lot of commonalities between these or these insects and um, the other creatures that um, we've talked about. So because we're going to be listening, if you have speakers or headphones, I have heard from some people for whom I've done some parts of this presentation that it's helpful to have um, them plugged in. Um, so that's you'll see that's why I'm wearing headphones myself. And um, my uh, department head would not let me uh, continue without just stating as a public employee, I am not accepting an honorarium. Um, while I think it's wonderful that West Cook Wild Ones uh, does provide an honorarium that is actually not allowed under the terms of our um, ethics. So I just want to make that clear because I know this will be going on uh, YouTube. And um, yes, if there's anything that's not clear, uh, feel free to let me know. I am speaking from my experience as a naturalist in the forest preserves uh, of Cook County, and I'm just going to look at the um, chat briefly. So some folks new to the area. So this is exciting. Um, I'm glad to see that you're joining us. And it's also gonna make one of my polls very interesting. Um, so Laura and uh, Adrian know what's gonna come. And a no lawn home owner, owner. excellent. Okay, I appreciate it. And anybody else who hasn't typed in the chat, please do let me know. Um, so a lot of the pictures and photos that you're going to see actually come from Southwest Cook County at Sagawa Environmental Learning Center, where I worked as a naturalist for many years. Um, but overall, the fact that we're in the third largest metropolitan area, and yet, you know, one in every 11 acres is forest preserve is something that I am very thankful for um, every day, um, even though I, you know, live in the city of Chicago, the fact that I, as a city dweller, benefit from the lungs and, you know, kidneys of the forest preserves of Chicago land. I appreciate that very much. And here in the forest preserves, we acknowledge that we're on the lands of the Anishinaabeg or the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwa, the Ottawa and Potawatomi, as well as the Miami, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Sauk, and Meskwaki peoples. So as a land management agency, I think it's important that we acknowledge the role that we've played in shaping the histories of local Native Americans by acquiring this land. And we recognize, share, and celebrate their immemorial ties to this land. The Chicago area is home to one of the largest um, communities of urban American Indians, has a lot of thriving organizations, and the traditional ecological knowledge is really important as we consider um, the fact that indigenous peoples have had been shaping this land, have, have had relationships with this land since the glaciers receded about 12 to 14,000 years ago. Um, so for those of you who may be from farther south, you know that is a very interesting and important thing to note as we're talking about um, flashing and singing. And so I just want, you know, Adrian, thank you for that lovely introduction. I just wanted to give you a little bit of insight into some of the different projects, including the um, the insect collection that I curate at Sagawa. I've been monitoring dragonflies and damselflies for a decade now. And I'll try not to get off topic, but uh, you can I can go in any of a hundred different directions depending on your interests. So do use the chat. My goal today is to review why 
singing insects and flashing insects um, bring attention to themselves in ways that could result in them being eaten? Why do they do this? Um, what's important about these insects? I hope to inspire you to be able to tune into them at night, um, whether it's a walk in uh, a, an area, a natural area or in your backyard and to review what you can do or what you're already doing in service of these insects and beneficial insects as a whole. And so I'd like to start actually by putting us in, in the mood, shall we say. We're going to get ourselves um, listening. We're gonna start with just a little listening exercise to help us uh, take us back to the sounds of uh, two months ago, shall we say. Um, and Laura and Adrian, please interrupt if the sound doesn't come through for some reason. Ever since I was a kid, I've loved to spend time outdoors from summer picnics with friends to long walks in the fall, singing insects have been the soundtracks to my life and a constant inspiration for me to make my own music. I guess that's why I became an audio artist that focuses on acoustic ecology. There's, imagine a multitude of insects in an area playing their music with the wind and the birds. It's almost as if it's in perfect sync. It's like an orchestra of macro creatures playing background music for a giant film. Given that I have studied singing insects for 15 years now, it's obvious that I find them fascinating. As an ecologist, I am especially interested in their diversity, habitat preferences, conservation concerns, responses to climate change and behavior, including how they make their sounds. Are those sounds familiar or unfamiliar? Uh, funny enough, uh, when we were talking before, uh, for those of you who perhaps did not grow up in areas with cicadas, among the singing insects we're gonna talk about, it can be a very new sound. And we've got some exciting things happening next year in the cicada world that we will uh, touch on in a moment. So I'm going to start with talking a little bit about singing insects and in introducing you to them, their biology, conservation, and then we're going to talk about flashing insects. And when I'm talking about singing insects, I'm talking about a few different groups. So the first one is uh, are our crickets and our katydids and our grasshoppers. They're in what we call the order Orthoptera. And so here on the top, you may see some, here's some different examples of um, crickets and crickets are often, if you recognize them, they, these ones look very different for the most part there, they range the ground crickets and field crickets range in the darker colors. So they're more the browns, the blacks, you know, blending in with the leaf litter. And then we also have some tree crickets, which are green, but they tend to be um, smaller insects with uh, long antennae they are making noise often from the ground or the shrub layer. So um, with the exception of some species of tree crickets, which we'll be calling from, from higher up. And then we have our katydids and our katydids look are um, very good leaf impersonators. Um, so I can find them very difficult to spot even after having done this for quite a few years. I appreciate having children with me because kids are very good at getting their eyes uh, on katydids. And they tend to have very long antenna and they are also in this group of insects where the males sing in or, or make noise that they consider singing or that we can call singing in order to attract mates. For the most part, um, the females do not make sound um, and that's based on anatomical limitations. They literally don't necessarily have the um, file and scraper. And so what we mean by that is that if you look very close up on the interlacing wings of a cricket or a katydid, you'll see 
that they use their wings to do what's called stridulate. That means rubbing one body part against another to make sound. And a lot of times you can think of the file as something like a comb, right? And my blurring, I have to put in front of my face so you can see it. So they're taking a scraper or a hard edge of their wing and scraping it against a file. I'm gonna show you in this video what that looks like when it's slowed down. Because you heard those sounds very quick. It was clicks and trills. Um, but when you slow down, and Katie did, this is what it looks and sounds like. Um, and can you tell me, can you all see my mouse? Because I'm going to use it to point something out. We can. Okay, great. Thank you. So here is where the file and the scraper is. So you've got one part that's on the top of the bottom wing and then the other part rubbing against the top. And this was a Katie did that I found on Joe Pieweed um, at Sagawa. You can see it's a very well-loved plant. There's a lot of different insects that love to feed on Joe Pieweed. If you think about O as a universal donor for blood, I sort of think of Joe Pieweed as a universal donor for leaves. There's an incredible diversity of insects that will feed on it. So we found this long spurred meadow Katie did, and I took the slow-mo video. So it sounds very different um, at a faster level, but I want to just play it a little bit more so you can see that effect again right here. So that's how the males are making their sound. And on most species of katydids and crickets, the females don't have those hardened part of their wings to be able to make that sound. There are a few species where they will make a response sound. Um, and have any of you ever seen, you know, this long sort of sword-like thing or something that looks like a stinger on a cricket or a katydid? If you have, those are the females. And what you've been seeing is what's called their ovipositor, what the females use to lay their eggs. And this species in particular, this cone-headed katydid has a very long one, which is why I, I took this picture so you could see. Um, and so the females are gonna be ovipositing in, or depositing their eggs in vegetation or in the soil. Now we have another couple of uh, groups of insects that also make noise in order for them that the in which the males make songs in order to attract mates. Uh, one of them is here are is a group of our grasshoppers. Um, so not all grasshoppers are singing insects, but here's an example of one type, a Carolina grasshopper. A lot of times at the end of summer, these look like butterflies to people because when they open their front wings, their hind wings flash this incredible um, colorful demonstration. And by snapping or clapping their wings together, they can make a sound. Um, and also sometimes I've only been lucky enough to see this once is you'll actually see a male hovering above a female and making a visual display with his wings. So here is a, a male here, he's smaller uh, that the, than the female. So we have some of these band wing grasshoppers uh, also in the group Orthoptera. And then we have our cicadas. And cicadas are a whole different group. They're what we call our true bugs. Uh, but they're what I think of as the sounds of Midwestern summers. We have some species that sing every summer. That means you'll hear them every summer. Their life cycle, they can take a few years till they become as adults. But when they emerge, the males um, will use these drums in order to sing and they have actually this air sac under their timbre. Um, they have this air sac that resonates inside to produce a very loud song, really disproportionate to their relatively small size. 
So we've got some species that are what we call dog day or annual cicadas. That's because we hear them every summer. And then we have some species that are what we call periodical because they're on a synchronized um, emergence cycle. And so who knows, let's see, you can make use of the chat. Who knows when we're expecting the next large emergence in West Cook County? Yes, next year, 2024. Um, so let's all get ready. Um, there, there have been some prior emergences. So we do know every year since the 1960s, every 17 years, there's been a four year early emergence of a group of them. They're still on a 17 year cycle, but emerging every, four years earlier. So in 2020, I saw a significant number of them uh, at Sagawa. And then last year, how many of you saw or heard a group? Um, we did have several areas where you could hear and actually see them depositing their eggs, um, see evidence in the trees of cicadas laying their eggs uh, last year. So here I'm based out of Salt Creek Resource Management in Western Springs. And I saw quite a few and heard quite a few uh, periodical cicadas. And they're, given that they're really loud, it uh, raises the obvious question, why sing, right? It's quite the, um, it's a it puts you a little bit at risk to sing, right? These guys, they're pretty, the males, and I'm saying guys, literally, they're the males, they're pretty obvious. You can find them when they're singing. And that's a risk because they can definitely be eaten. So what is the advantage? Oh, I love, I have to, give me just a moment. And I see somebody had a surprising number of them this year. Um, so I'm going to just stop my screen share for a moment. Give me just a moment. Yep, I'm going to share this. Um, current slide. Okay. So, like I said, the males are using these songs to attract their mates. And sometimes it actually serves to attract other males to critical mass so that they can create a chorus that's loud enough to then attract females. So if you're thinking about um, calling frogs, for example, this can be similar to that. There are other species where if a male is singing here and then all of a sudden he hears me play a recording, or another male, he'll actually move to space out. And so he'll space them out. Oftentimes with uh, a lot of meadow katydids, you'll see this phenomenon or tree crickets where all the males will space out within a population. Um, but you'll see that there, there's also some other different songs. I'm gonna play some of those calling songs, but when a female is close, then a male may change uh, the sound of his song. He may change to a series of clicks rather than trills. I've seen this with field crickets and ground crickets. Sometimes you'll see them make a sound as, uh, as a protest to being caught by a human like myself or in response to a predator. So I one time saw two robins flying past me. One was chasing the other very quickly. Um, the first one was making an insane, very unrobin like sound. And I was very confused. I did not know that robins could make that sound. And then when they flew back the other way, I saw that the first one actually had a cicada in, in its beak. And it was the cicada that was making this very loud clicking sound. Um, so they can make the sounds in response to a predator. And then there are a few species in which the females will make a sort of response. So in cicadas, when a male and a female are close to each other, if a male sings, a female will snap her wing in order to um, indicate continued interest. And then there are a few species like the greater angle wing and the true Katie did where the females can um, make a noise as well with their body. And so then the question becomes, you know, why, do, why am I encouraging you to listen to these insects, uh, they have an important ecological role. Um, 
And if you've heard about sort of these different articles about insect declines and insect apocalypse, if any of the other speakers talked about that in the context of bird and bat populations or reptile populations, well, we're trying to understand better what's driving insect declines, where there are insect declines, um, and what they're being maybe impacted by negatively or positively, what aspects of our management or your garden are um, benefiting insects. And what's nice about singing insects is that you can actually hear the males. And so it's an easy way to monitor them without having to catch them, photograph them. You can act literally just go and sit outside. And most of them sing at night. So you could go and sit outside at night, um, but there are some daytime singers as well. And what we're finding is that it's actually allowing us to document uh, things like climate change. So we have some species that are moving north every year as we're monitoring singing insects. And in particular, because most of these singing insects are herbivores, then they're more responsive and sensitive to things like pesticide or herbicide drift. Um, there are a few predaceous katydids, but for the most part, they're feeding on plants or sap in plants. And they're laying their eggs oftentimes in, some, there's a number of these species. This is from this greater angle-winged katydid. I actually um, had this female, I had brought her inside for a program I was going to do. And then that night she deposited these sort of cantaloupe-like seeds in the soil um, of the enclosure I had put her in before I uh, released her. And so, they can give us a more complete picture of ecological restoration, including the soil. Because what we're understanding in our home gardens, in our restorations and natural areas is that what's happening below ground is a whole area um, is sometimes a lot more important than what's happening above ground, but it's also a lot less understood. We haven't been studying it as well, particularly in our restorations. And so we are seeing both declines of uh, flying insects. That's a whole nother talk um, about insect declines. Um, but in terms of conservation, when we're thinking about how do we conserve these insects that play such an important part in the food web, right? We've got birds that feed on them, bats, herps, so reptiles, amphibians, there's all these, even coyotes. I have found at the end of the fall, just scats that are full of nothing but grasshopper legs. Um, so they've eaten all the juicy inside parts, these parts right here, and just, you know, the undigested parts are the legs that don't have all of that fat and protein that this part has. So what's driving, um, you know, we want to understand how to better conserve them. And in order to do so, we have to understand their life cycle, not just what the different stages are, um, you know, here we've got, you know, they lay an egg for the purposes of our crickets, katydids, grasshoppers, and cicadas. They're all, they all have what we call incomplete metamorphosis. So unlike like a butterfly, these ones, when the eggs hatch, they're actually what we call nymphs. Um, and they go through a few different instars like this, but the nymphs look like little adults, but without the wings, the wings are not fully developed. And they develop over time, shed their exoskeleton and go on and so on and so forth over a few stages of molt until they become an adult and mate. So that doesn't tell us a whole lot of information, but where insects are concerned, there's a few key aspects of their life cycle that we want to know. So one, we wanna know where they are laying their eggs because if they're ovipositing that habitat and what they need for that part of their life cycle is important in the conservation. So for crickets, katydids, and grasshoppers, they're either ovipositing in vegetation. So those sword-like ovipositors, uh, like this one here, they're using it to cut open a slit in grasses or forbs, and then laying their eggs there or in the soil. So with grasshoppers, they'll be actually sort of burrowing their um, abdomens into the soil and the females are depositing their eggs in soil. Whereas in cicadas, the females are using their ovipositor to actually cut slits open in twigs of trees. They'll lay their eggs there. And then when the eggs hatch, they fall down to the ground and burrow into the soil. 
So when we get to the point today where we want to talk about conservation, understanding where that egg, the nursery, essentially, what's the nursery? Where are they going to be depositing their eggs is very important. Then we want to know what do the nymphs feed on? What kinds of food do they need? Many of our species of crickets, katydids, and uh, grasshoppers are generalists. So they may have a specific niche, maybe it's tree chops or you know, meadows. Um, some of them are specialists. They may need a specific sedge meadow or marsh grasslands, um, marshy areas in order to lay their eggs in order to feed as nymphs. And so that's part of what we have to think about when we're thinking about conservation. And then the other thing we wanna think about is where do they spend the winter? How do they survive the winter, right? They can't put on layers. Um, and obviously this fall, they're maybe able to still be more active, but for the most part, most of them are spending their winters as um, eggs. And so as eggs, um, whatever it is they need to insulate themselves or protect themselves from freezing um, or from temperatures below what they can withstand would be very important. So that means things like leaf litter. And so scientists are trying to figure out why are we starting to see some, some declines and they're concerned because these insects are nutritious. They're full of fat and protein. Um, and I have this picture of this Eastern bluebird here because if you see those beautiful rusty feathers, well, they're getting those feathers from these pigments that are in crickets and grasshoppers. Um, so if there's not very many crickets and grasshoppers when a male is molting and he's starting to grow in his breeding feathers, well, then he's not going to look very impressive to a female bluebird, and that's going to decrease his reproductive output, or that he'll have fewer babies, right? Um, and so we're trying to figure out why even in nature preserves we're seeing these declines. And that's part of why I've been um, trying to help people get used to um, listening and documenting what we have in our residential areas. Um, what species are able to actually come into your yards if you convert your lawn into a no lawn um, area. And so I'd like to, if you all are up for it, uh, I'd like to actually play a few sounds. And I see the question, is there an app that IDs insect sounds? So the answer to that is yes and no. Right now, there's not an app where you could just record a song and the app will give you a suggestion in the way that iNaturalist does, but you can use iNaturalist, like um, Kathy Thomas said, to record sounds that you hear and then others will go through and listen to them. I actually do that at the end of each field season. I go through and listen to them and do my best to identify them. But because they can sound different at different temperatures. One thing that I find very helpful in trying to identify as somebody who's listening is if you make note of habitat. So where you are, are you in a woodland, a backyard, a wetland, a prairie? Um, what time of day is it? Which iNaturalist will show. What the rough temperature it is. A 50, if it's 55 degrees, versus 80 degrees, the ambient air temperature, that can be different than what you see um, and the ground. So that's why it's helpful to know, are you hearing it up in the trees? Are you hearing it in the ground? Because the cold, there've even been days um, in the fall during fall burn season where it's 32, 34 or 40 degrees ambient air temperature, but I'll still hear crickets calling because the insulated ground layer keeps that area much warmer. And so to them, functionally, it's more like 55 degrees or 50 degrees, and they can still move their body, even though they're, you know, so-called cold-blooded or ectothermic um, organisms. So temperature of the ambient air, but then also location where you're hearing it is really helpful for those of us who are listening to those um, sounds to be able to help you identify it. But yes, iNaturalist will identify the sounds. Um, okay, so I'm going to use, try to use my, uh, little technique 
of uh, how I've been teaching people to learn some insect songs. So we're going to learn to tune our ears. I'm going to play just a few because I do want to have time to talk about flashing insects as well. Um, but one of the things about one of the ways I found that's helpful to learn how to identify singing insects in particular is to try to compare it to a mechanical or other sound, right? They're not like birds that have lovely notes and harmonies and trills. Um, right, they're using these hard parts of their exoskeleton to make sound. So we're going to listen to this species of cicada, and I'm betting that a number of you have heard it, but feel free to give me a thumbs up with your um, function on Zoom if you've heard this, if you recognize this one. Okay, I have to pull up the chat so I can see who recognizes this. Okay, so this is a cicada, and this is one that I actually, it, it can be similar. I, I, I actually think 17-year cicadas sound very similar to this one, some of them. Um, but I, this one actually gets its name for its song, and it's called a scissor grinder cicada. And I get, uh, I recruited my fellow naturalist, Leslie DeCourcy, who's at Sagawa, to improve my really sad sketches and create what I'm calling sonoglyphs. So these pictorial representations of songs um, to help people remember. And so Leslie is a much better artist uh, than I am. And so um, she gave, drew this to help us reminder, remember that this insect is actually named after what it sounds like, which is a scissor grinder. So imagine that whetstone, that stone turning around and putting the blade up against it. I don't know about you, but I have not ever sharpened my scissors like this. I do use files and whetstones to sharpen knives, chainsaws, things like that, depending on the tool. Um, I also sort of think of this one in particular like a fight, like an ambulance siren, just that rare, rare, rare. So I'm going to play it again. Let's try that part one more time. Now you don't have to agree with me, but if you find it helpful, you've now learned scissor grinder cicada. So you now all know the song of an insect that you will hear every year, particularly in um, residential areas. So this is a species that I hear that is common in our what we would call our urban forest. Now there's a cricket. We're gonna try it with cricket. That to me sounds like an intergalactic ray gun. So I imagine Marvin the Martian, who is a very popular, uh, right, Warner Brothers character, right, cartoon. And when I hear the song of this cricket, I think of some sort of ray gun. It's just something about the sound. So I'm going to play three crickets. I want you to listen to each one. And then, um, Laura, after we listen to the three, then Laura's going to put the poll on and you can choose. I just want, this is out of curiosity more than anything, which one you think sounds like the intergalactic ray gun. So let's start with the Carolina ground cricket. Carolina ground cricket, Unimobius carolinus. Okay, so that was candidate number one, the Carolina ground cricket. Now we're going to try the handsome Crig, another one, Trig, another one that's going, you're going to hear uh, calling oftentimes from the ground. And it's a very teeny tiny cricket. Handsome Trig, 
Philopalpus pulcellus. So that was number two, Handsome Trig. And then I'm going to play number three, the Allard's Ground Cricket. These songs are all being shared with permission from Will Hirschberger, um, one of the co-authors of Songs of Insects, and I'll link to their website. Allard's Ground Cricket, Allanomobius Allardi. Typical songs followed by songs given as males interact. Okay, so I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to play each one one more time, just very briefly. We're going to see how many, I see only 10. Carolina of ground cricket, Unimobius carolinus. And since the poll seems to be really a race between ground Carolina and Allard's, I'll play the Allard's one more time. Allard's Ground Cricket, Allanomobius Allardi. Typical songs followed by songs given as males interact. Okay, I'm going to end the poll, y'all. This is funny because it would change depending on which one I was playing. Okay, so let's share the results. Um, so it sounds like most of you thought that the Carolina ground cricket sounds like an, this uh, intergalactic ray run here. Nope, that's not the one I was showing, this one. Um, I actually happen to think the Allard's ground cricket sounds more like an intergalactic ray gun. That's the image that I have in my mind. But the point is, is that if that sound brings up an image for you, that's the way that I have learned how to identify these songs um, has been to uh, look at those and listen and think about what does it remind me of. So this is a tool if you're interested in pursuing that we you can uh, come and uh, see the Singing Insects Monitoring Program and come and learn some of the songs. Um, but I, in the interest of time, I think I am going to need to need to go and i'm glad that you like the art i think leslie is incredible the fact that she can render this is actually an allard's ground cricket that i asked her to render because that's what i think sounds more like it um and what i love is that she rendered the cricket realistically while also holding a ray gun so i'm glad i'll have to let leslie know that everybody appreciated that so Singing insects are a part of the nighttime landscape, and you can imagine a lot of them, like I was showing you with the cicadas, they're actually very hard to distinguish visually because that's not how they're getting selected for by their mates, right? If a uh, cicada, they're really attracting their mates, the males are calling out to their mates using their song. So it's the songs that distinguish them. But if you look at these various uh, designs there, you'll notice that they actually can look very similar. So a lot of our annual cicadas are very hard to distinguish um, visually. You have to actually listen to their song. Um, and so that's one of the fun things about singing insects is that it can start to make you, um, it's something that you can observe without having to stop. You can slow down. But it's something that I can observe when I'm going on a walk or even driving by with a with the windows down. And they provide part of the nightscape. But I think I also want to make sure that we have a chance to talk a little bit about fireflies or flashing insects or lightning bugs. And so my question for you Mm -hmm. share a portion of the string. I want you to think back to your childhood 
and to what you heard your parents calling these insects. And I'm actually going to use the chat for this because I also want to know. So if you are at a computer, if you don't mind opening that document, what I'm asking you to do is say where, yes, where you grew up. And you can use the chat. I feel like the chat is working really well, but I'm gonna share this visual document so you can see. And I'm wondering, what did you grow up hearing your parents call them and where did you grow up? Um, because I hear them both a lot in the uh, Chicago region, but I'm going to share what our results are so far. I'm gonna go from here to here. So, so far, it's either fireflies or lightning bugs, but I'm waiting to see where people grew up. So just right in the in there, like I, I grew up in Milwaukee, so I wrote down what the what the results were. I just wrote down where I grew up and I was curious. And if it was in Illinois or the Chicago region, can you write where? So was it in the city? If it was north, west, or south? Um, and if it was in the suburb, what suburb? And I'll show you why in a moment. And I'm going to enter what I'm seeing in the chat. This is fun. Oh, I love it. Mom said firefly. Grandmother would say lightning bug in St. Louis. Western New York. I'm seeing a vote for lightning bugs in Milwaukee also. Chicago. And did I miss, I saw Western New York. Thank you for doing my, in, my informal poll. I will share this out with you all at the end if you want to have that link, because I think it's very interesting. I've asked a number of groups this over uh, the years from groups that visit Sagawa Environmental Learning Center. And I've noticed a slight divide between north side and northern suburbs have tended to say fireflies, the high school students that come, and city of Chicago, west and southern suburbs have tended to say lightning bugs. And I'm not, um, I don't know what kind of a pattern that is, but I'll show you what the pattern is according to <laughs> according to the Cambridge online survey there we go the light so red is people who use lightning fly lightning bug and firefly interchangeably um, but then there's a lot of areas where firefly is used or lightning bug. And it seems like lightning bug seems to be more of a, um, I see a lot of this in Pennsylvania, but it's a fun, I just always find the human aspect of this very interesting. So I am going to say lightning bug and firefly interchangeably because I'm influenced by my environment too. And these are insects. We're going to talk a little bit about them that um, communicate visually at, uh, in some way, in some part of their life cycle. So thinking about the fact that I was going to present this in November, this summer, I did attempt to make recordings. I am by no means a professional photographer, but I did make some recordings. And I want you to pay attention to two things as we watch this. So the first time you watch it, I want you to just tell me what color flash of light do you think you're seeing? And you can write it in the chat for me. Okay, I'm going to play that one more time because it was very short. And your options might be, is it more yellowish, more greenish, more whitish or orangish. It's 
warm white. So yellowish. I love seeing the diversity of answers. Green, white. I find it weird because even every time I watch it, um, this is one of the few videos where I managed to get only one firefly or lightning bug, only one individual flashing in the video. Almost all of the rest of them, it was multiple. This is one of the only ones where it was the same individual. And yet to me, the flashes look slightly different color, which could have to do with their uh, distance maybe as it was moving uh, away. And how many flashes do you see? I'm gonna play it one more time to give you a chance to decide how many flashes you see. You can tell that Salt Creek Resource Management is not far from a Midway Airport. I'm gonna play it one more time. Yes, most people see all four. That's very fun. Okay, good. So we have species, um, some species of fireflies are lightning bugs. Let me move my screen back to my other presentation. So what makes them a lightning bug or a firefly? Number one, they're neither a true fly, so they're not a fly like in the way that a house fly is, nor are they a true bug, like a stink bug. Those are each different orders of insects. Fireflies and lightning bugs are actually beetles, so they're in the order Coleoptera, and they're in the family, I spelled that one wrong, Lampyridae. Um, and for example, the video I was playing for you, those are of a group that have nocturnal adults. So those adults are actually communicating and active at night and different species will be active at different parts of the night and maybe may partition their resources based on how high or low they are in the canopy or in the grass. And then we also have some diurnal adults, so day active adults like this alichnia here. Um, generally, the way you can distinguish them is you do you notice how on the wings or the um, elytra, the hardened forewings, there's no light coloration along the edge of the wings. That's a day flying firefly rather than these nocturnal adults. And the way that you know it's a firefly, I actually, I took a picture, but I forgot to include it here because there are some other beetles and um, even flies and moths that are good firefly um, impersonators is that unlike some of them, the true fireflies or lampyridae can hide their heads behind this um, pronotum here. That's what we call this part right there is the part that is um, directly anterior to their wings, whereas other beetles cannot. And one of the reasons why we have other beetles that impersonate them is because fireflies actually have some cardiac glycosides. So these are chemicals that are bad tasting and um, deter predators. So once a predator has experienced a lightning, light flashing insects that it eats and is very distasteful, it is unlikely to eat it again. For the most part, there are definitely individual predators, specific frogs, specific birds that have somehow evolved the ability to be able to eat these without um, dying or getting very sick. Um, but for the most part, all of these insects, even the ones that do not light up at night, have some of these um, have some of these uh, chemicals in them. But what makes them all fireflies or lightning bugs? is that as in their life cycle, their eggs, their larvae, and their pupae all have the ability to generate this very efficient source of light using these two different chemicals. And I don't have time to get into the chemistry, um, but they make a very efficient, 90% efficient light um, where it produces very little heat and different species can produce different kinds of color hues. 
Um, and so one of the ways I discovered this is I was actually doing some nighttime gardening. I had bought some plants from the West Cook Wild Ones plant sale and they were drying out my little plugs and I really needed to get them into my little gangway strip. And so it was eight o'clock at night and it was pretty dark, but there was enough light out from the ambient light that I was able to start digging. And lo and behold, as I was digging holes, I found some firefly larvae and I could see the glow at nighttime. So even the day flying adults, even if the adults are not making and generating that light, they're in their egg, larval, and pupil form, they can. And the reason why I asked you about the color is that we can use color, among other things, to help us try to identify our species. There's a really beautiful book that I scanned this just to give you a, a little taste of by Lynn Faust called Fireflies, Glowworms, and Lightning Bugs. And um, she, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. And we're going to see if my attempt to do it. It's this beautiful book here. And she has a beautiful insert that has, um, I would say, probably 40 different species. And it shows all the different ways. This is where my attempt to blur my background is not working for me. All, it gives you different ways of being able to count the flash patterns, how long its lamp, um, how long its lantern is on versus off, um, to be able to help you uh, guess or make an educated guess as to what species you have. And so, for example, here Photinus pyralis is one of our most common species here, and it's often called the Big Dipper because as it's lighting its lantern in his abdomen he flies in a J pattern. And so if it's about 73 degrees at night, if it's any warmer, it might be more frequent. You can actually count by seconds in order to see that flash pattern. Um, and you might be able to tell, honestly, with Photinus pyralis, you're going to be able to tell just because of that really distinctive J as they're flying with their lit uh, lanterns there. So our lightning bugs or our fireflies, they actually have a different kind of life cycle. And let me just check on the chat to make sure I'm not, oh, thank you, Laura for share, and Adrian for sharing that link. Um, a lot of, there's been a lot of focus on restricting light, um, artificial light at night. So trying to prevent there from being light pollution. And that is really important for fireflies because if there's too much light the research does show that males um, do not flash as frequently and females are actually less receptive and they flash less frequently um, from in response to males when there's a lot of ambient light these are things like from street lamps you know um, string lights that people will put in their backyards to make it cheerful in the summer things like that um, and that is really important that artificial light is not at night, but there are also these insects spend the vast majority of their time in their life cycle as adults. Anywhere from 10 months to a year in 10 months. Okay. So about two years, one to two years in Northern areas. And so what affects their larval habitat is really important in terms of their conservation. And we are seeing um, people are calling it like blink outs. We're seeing areas um, throughout North America where we're seeing fewer and fewer lightning bugs or insects. And so one of the important things to know is that the larvae, they're really, they're eating, they're predaceous monsters. They eat soft bodied invertebrates. So what do we mean by soft bodied invertebrates? These are slugs, snails, um, caterpillars that they find in the leaf litter, often many of those moths that we were talking about a few months ago. And so any type of pesticides that are meant to kill, for example, beetle grubs in lawn are going to kill both these larvae and or the food that they eat. Um, things that kill the slugs are then therefore taking away the food that these larvae eat when they've emerged from eggs. And we're finding these the larvae um, 
are in the soil. And this is actually a picture I took last week uh, when I was on the fire line. So we're doing prescribed burn, we're in prescribed burn season right now in the forest preserves. And I found this little guy inside of, in a log uh, that uh, came apart as I was trying to uh, put out a little bit of fire on the outside of the logs. But then when it came apart, I couldn't help being an entomologist looking inside to see who's in here, who can I protect from the water. And I found this little um, lightning bug larva. So they need areas that are moist. They're, in other parts of the world, there's actually species where the larvae are aquatic, but not here in Illinois. Are there any questions about that before I just conclude on a few thing, you know, on a few notes about what we can do in terms of their conservation? Let me go to the chat. Okay. If they come up, you can type in the chat. So there's an abundance of research that is really showing that our that there are a lot of different things that are affecting insect populations, by which we mean there's threats to their diversity, so number of different species that evolved in these habitats since the glaciers receded, but also their abundances, how many of them are there. And so people often talk about this as death by a thousand cuts. It's not any one thing. But in a survey of uh, specifically firefly researchers, what um, that Lynn Faust and others were involved in, what they found um, the researchers really thought were the main drivers of firefly or lightning bug decline was habitat loss and fragmentation, insecticides and herbicides, so different pesticides, and then pollution, artificial light. And then for our singing insects, obviously noise pollution um, can affect them a lot. Also herbicides, I should, add, I should add herbicides here because they are herbivorous. Um, and so they things will accumulate in their bodies as well as invasive species. You know, I think urbanization and agriculture are really contributing to the habitat loss and fragmentation. And then also climate change. So in, insects really need to enough moisture to survive and droughts really hurt their ability to do so and it can affect our soil. And so the question becomes, well, what factors are in our control? This is a little overwhelming and no, no one of us can um, address all of it. Um, but what I would encourage you to remember is that we have been able to turn around the ship before. So with the Clean Water Act in 1948 and then strengthened to its modern form in 1972, We've seen an overall increase in freshwater insect abundance since the 1960s. So we were able to act to protect our waterways and see benefits that way. So what I would say is that I encourage what I call a holistic approach to insect conservation. That means looking at the insect in the context of its whole life cycle, right? That life cycle that I showed you before, I'm going to try to find it. I'm going to put it in this slide. Um, I'll move it, but back to here, thinking about where, what does the insect need in order to lay its eggs? What does this insect need for the larvae to be able to survive and the pupa to survive? How does it survive the winter, which for fireflies is in larval form? And then how do the adults find their mates and successfully reproduce? And so a holistic approach thinks about all of that rather than trying to just do sort of one little thing. Um, it's sort of like, you know, a holistic approach to my kid's health or my own health, right? I can't just eat more spinach and assume that that's going to help me overall in my nutrition, but that can be a part of it. So the role that West Cook Wild Ones plays that I think is really important is really helping encourage people bridge the creation of habitat in our natural areas, like our forest preserves, state parks and state forests with habitat in our yards, community gardens, school and library gardens, you know, in public areas. And one of the important things, and I pulled this slide actually from my general insect uh, conservation talk, is about thinking about where insects, if they're nesting species, like some of our social bees, where do they nest? 
Where do they lay their eggs? What do they need? And then how do they survive the winter? So for our singing insects, overwintering in mostly egg format, protecting that soil, leaving the leaf litter can be very important. For our fireflies, things like dead wood, moisture in the soil, also very important. Building habitat, um, this is why I think the um, native plant sale is so important and is a really important resource that West Cook Wild Ones provides because you want to be able to buy native plants. This is actually a plant that I purchased from the West Cook Wild Ones plant sale. Um, you want to be able to plant native plants in your gardens or if you're replacing your lawn or areas of your lawn with native plants that you can be confident have not been treated with herbicides or pesticides. Um, and when our native lightning bugs or fireflies, because they're predaceous, they're feeding on things like slugs and snails. And what are snugs and snails eating? They're eating the leaves on our plants. And so if we treat them or if we buy plants from a big box store that's treated them, then we're not accomplishing what we want to. Um, and so I want you to remember that these native insects, they co-evolved with the plants that are native to this area. Some of those plants, we may find out, act as pharmaceuticals to insects. We've definitely found that for bumblebees, for example. If you're in an urban area, um, protect trees and the soil around them. So this is a honey locust that breaks my heart every time I pass by it because there's so much soil compaction here. People are walking their dogs along the parkway. Their dogs are peeing on the soil. People are, have, ex the roots are exposed. So these are no longer doing work, but then the roots that are in the ground are gonna have a very hard time helping provide um, nutrients and water to this tree if there's soil compaction. So caring for your urban trees um, and keeping them healthy is gonna be a really important way of protecting our cicadas in particular. We're seeing a decline in our 17 year cicadas. Um, we're seeing areas where the population and the emergences are much smaller than they were in years before. And when they're underground for those 17 years, they're feeding on sap of trees, shrubs, and that's what everybody says is trees and shrubs. I have found the nymphs in other areas that are pretty far from tree and shrub roots. So I think there's definitely other plant sap as well, but we want to protect them um, and keep them healthy. And I already did talk about the herbicides. And then you mentioned the International Dark Sky Initiative, but eliminating artificial light at night as much as possible. And there's a number of ways. I think the Xerxes Society's Firefly Friendly Lighting Practices is a really helpful one for um, things that you can that people are doing and that you can do to still have lighting when you need it, um, but to adjust the light so that it's not creating this artificially um, light uh, evening sky that looks more crepuscular or dawn or daytime. And I just wanna conclude by giving you a few examples of how we're managing our lands and the forest preserves in ways that benefit insects um, and a variety of them, including fireflies. Insects co-evolved with regular prescribed fire. So we could do a whole talk just on that. But um, the important thing to know is that the indigenous peoples who continue to have you know, relationships with this land today, all of these different tribes, there's a number of them that have been using prescribed fire since the glaciers receded. And we see this with indigenous peoples all around the world and traditional practices all around the world. And what regular prescribed fire does is that it results in patchy fires. So instead of getting a fuel buildup, which can then lead to a very, very hot scorching fire that then also kills the soil, what it does is you get fires that burn areas, but not the whole area. And they're relatively quick, not hot, and you still maintain your soil in areas that are refugia where the insects will repopulate. So these regular prescribed fires actually a really important part of it. Um, 
in the forest preserves managing deer, we have a lot of overpopulation of deer and overpopulation of deer leads to browsing. I don't have a good slide of it here, but it leads to over browsing. So for example, we would not find this beautiful wood fern here if we have overpopulation of deer. They're gonna browse all of the yummy, yummy plants and you're going to have very little greenery left for our diversity of native insects. And so deer management is actually really important. This means maintaining populations of deer um, below the overpopulation that we see in a lot of preserves and parks and urban areas. And then, like I said before, this dead wood is really good wood. This is helping contribute to the moisture of the soil, as does leaf litter, ground covers, um, and things like that. And so what I want to really um, encourage you to do is to ask me your questions, but this next season, um, I hope you can use some of the resources that I'm going to provide here. Actually, I'll put these. I had a bunch of links in this slide that I wanted to put in the chat. I don't know why it doesn't. Okay, there we go. It makes my chat things very weird. I don't know why my chat's not working, but I'll send these to Laura and Adrian to share with you. Um, but my hope is that in the next season, in our next flight season, singing season, flashing season, that you can go out not just during the daytime, but also take advantage of your yard, community areas, parks, or even monitoring in the forest preserves. You can monitor at night if you are a singing insect monitor. We have dark sky monitors who are monitoring light levels. And then the calling frog surveys in the spring. These are all ways that you can 